production of SICCOM. And today we're going to take you on a very exciting ride. We're going to start swimming under the sea with Justin. And then we're going to go and look at concrete and how to monitor the structural health of buildings with Yang. And then we're, uh, Peter is going to tell us how to build better battery-free acoustic communication. And then Jay is going to tell you how can you protect yourself from people who are trying to use wireless signals to track you and monitor you. And finally, we're going to end with Himanshu, who's going to tell us how to use optical links, fiber optic, for basically virtual reality. So we're going to start with our first speaker, Justin Chan, who is a PhD student at the University of Washington. His research focuses on building systems that democratize tools for scientific exploration and high quality medical testing for millions of people. So let's hear what Justin has to say. All right, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so uh, I'm Justin Chan, and today I want to present to you a really fun project that we did where we were able to bring underwater messaging to smartphones and smartwatches. For more than a century, humans have been really interested in underwater communication. Here's a photograph of a boat by the Gray Telephone Company in 1901, and they were by the Boston Harbor. Within this ship is a large bell that they can submerge underwater and ring out a message to say, all well here. Fast forward a century, and underwater messaging still requires expensive hardware that's not really ubiquitous. Interestingly, this is the state of underwater networking today is similar to the ARPANET back in the 1970s, where only some universities and some companies would have access to these specialized tools. In this talk, we show for the first time how we can bring underwater messaging to smartphones just using a software app. Let me show you a quick demo of our system. Torchan and I are underwater here with our smartphones, and he's sending a message to me saying, are you OK? Which I then receive. I can then send back a reply saying that I am OK. The really, really cool thing about all of this is that this communication is occurring underwater on unmodified smartphones. So there's no additional hardware or equipment. It's just the phones themselves. Now let's dig a little deeper into the motivation behind all of this. Why do we care about underwater messaging in the first place? Every year, there are tens of millions of people that engage in activities like scuba diving and snorkeling. And effective communication is really critical here for safety and navigation. Typically, hand signals are what people used for this communication. Here's an example of a diver signing that he's out of air and don't swim up. But as you can imagine, given the visual nature of these signals, they really only work at short ranges, and they definitely do not work in low visibility waters that are cloudy or murky. So now we ask, OK, underwater messaging is important, but why do we want to bring them to mobile devices? Increasingly, smartphones are being used for underwater activities like photography and videography, as you can see here. And the latest smartwatches, like the Apple Watch, are in fact water resistant to shallow depths, so you can bring it down without any case for snorkeling activities. By enabling underwater messaging on these mobile devices, we can potentially scale our system to millions of people and millions of devices. In fact, this approach where you take software and just run it on existing hardware is a promising one, as the past few decades have shown by, that by doing this, we can achieve unprecedented scaling compared to if you were to just use expensive and specialized hardware. The problem with just using smartphones is that if you were to use the built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth chips, that's going to work fine over the air, but the moment you put it underwater, it's definitely not going to work. So let me show you what I mean. I'm trying to transfer a file from the left to the right phone here using Wi-Fi over the air. And as you'd expect, the download works fine. The progress bar is moving. But the moment you put it in the shallow water bath, the download times out. And when I pull it out of the water, the, yeah, so the download times out the moment I pull it out of the water. 
The reason for this is that radio signals attenuate by as much as 169 decibels per meter underwater. In this talk, we introduce Aqua App, which is the first acoustic underwater communication system that uses the speakers and microphones on smartphones and smartwatches. We present a real-time communication system that adapts to the frequency responses across different mobile devices, the multipath and the noise profiles of different environments, and it even works in mobility scenarios. We tested our system in six different environments in the presence of boats and people kayaking and fishing, and we achieved a bit rate of 100 bits per second to 1.8 kilobits per second at a range of 30 meters, and 10 to 20 bits per second at a range of 100 meters. Finally, we built messaging and SOS beacon applications on top of our platform. Now, there are two key design challenges that we need to tackle here when we design our system. The first is that there's significant frequency diversity across different smartphone models and across different environments. This plot here shows the frequency spectrum when you're sending a signal underwater. And as you can see, even between the very close by frequency bins, there's variation of up to 30 dB, which is huge. The second challenge is that the channel can change a lot because of mobility. We're dealing with humans here as users, and when humans move about underwater, the channel is going to change. In fact, the channel can change so frequently that between consecutive packets, packet one and packet two, the channel estimates can be drastically different, as you can see here. What this means is that if you were to run, say, a bitrate adaptation algorithm that used these channel estimates, you could get an order of magnitude difference in the bitrate selected between consecutive packets. What we need here is a real-time protocol that can do the bitrate selection, but on a per-packet basis while minimizing the amount of overhead. There are two key components to our adaptation protocol. The first is a post-preamble feedback mechanism for per-packet adaptation. And the second is a frequency band adaptation algorithm that minimizes the amount of feedback overhead. So let's take a look at the first part, the post-preamble feedback mechanism. If you take a look at a high data rate system like Wi-Fi, the packets are pretty small. They're only about a millisecond. What this means is that the channel is not really going to change very much from packet to packet. And in fact, if you run a rate adaptation algorithm on one packet, you could probably use the same rate for the next few packets as well. In contrast, in our underwater acoustic system, it's much lower data rate. The packet sizes are much longer, and what this means is that the channel is, in fact, likely to change from one packet to the next. To deal with this, we use a split packet approach design. And the idea here is that we split the preamble part of the packet and the data part of the packet, and we send them separately. So we're not transmitting them at the same time. We're sending them separately. So suppose Alice wants to send some data to Bob. Alice first sends the preamble to Bob. And then Bob performs channel estimation on this preamble and estimates what are the best frequencies that Alice should use to send the data. Bob then encodes these frequencies in a short feedback signal and sends it back to Alice. Alice can then send the data along on those selected frequencies. Now, the nice thing about all of this is that now we can do the per packet adaptation and minimize our packet error rate. Now let's move into what is this frequency adaptation algorithm that Bob is running. To illustrate, let me give you a concrete example. Here's the channel estimated by Bob. Let's say we split this up into n bins. We really don't want to be transmitting on the low SNR bins here. We really just want to be transmitting on the high SNR bins. So what our algorithm does is it selects the largest contiguous frequency band with good SNR and then just reallocates all the power just to that one band. Here's the band that has been identified by our algorithm, marked to green here, and it's denoted by F start and F end. So our algorithm, it's not going to transmit on the blue bins at all. It's just going to focus all of its power to the green bins. And what that does is it actually boosts the power of all the green bins, and it results in increased robustness for communication. Furthermore, because we only represent this frequency band using two pieces of information, the f star and the fn, it's a very small amount of information. And when you send it back, 
two hours, that's pretty short, and it minimizes the amount of communication overhead. So this means even if you do it very frequently from one packet to the next, there isn't much overhead at all. The other design details that were in our paper, such as differential coding for channel changes to code with channel changes within a packet, as well as a carrier sense MAC protocol to support networking between multiple devices. And you can look at our paper for more details. Now let's take a look at some of the results in our evaluation. We evaluated our system in six different real-world environments. We placed our phone in a waterproof pouch and loaded it with a rope underwater. Here's one of the environments we tested in. This is a lake, a park, a bridge, a 100-meter-long beach, a busy museum, and we even took a kayak all the way out to the deep seas to test more extensively at deeper depths. I want to focus on two key evaluations in this talk. The first is, how does Aqua App adapt its bitrate to different SNR regimes and different distances? And the second is, how does Aqua App adapt in real time to mobility scenarios? So let's take a look at the first evaluation. What we did was we ran our algorithm continuously at different distances, starting from 5 meters all the way to 30 meters. And here we plot on the x-axis the achieved bitrate, and on the y-axis we showed the CDF. So here's the CDF for 5 meters. The median achieved bitrate is 633 BPS. Here's the CDF for 10 meters, 20 meters, and finally 30 meters, where the median achieved bitrate scales down nicely to 133 BPS. The main takeaway from this is that our algorithm is able to adapt to the different SNR regimes at different distances and adapt its bitrate accordingly. Our system could support longer ranges as well. But in order to do that, we need to lower the bit rates. And to do that, we change our modulation scheme to use on-off keying. And we show here the bit error rate as a function of distance. I show this for the 5 BPS case, the 10 and the 20 BPS schemes. The key takeaway here is that even at the longest measured distance of 113 meters, we can get a bit error rate that's less than 1%, which means that we're able to support a stable communication link at over 100 meters and support SOS beacon applications. Our system adapts with mobility as well. So here's the CDF of the achieved bit rate. And we show it for the static scenario, which, where again, the median achieved bit rate is 633 BPS. Now, to simulate different mobility scenarios, what we did was we moved the phone up and down and left and right the rope at speeds that you would expect a diver to be moving at. The phones would also rotate on its axis so that the speakers and the microphones, they weren't always facing each other. They could be facing away as well. Here we show the CDF for the slow and fast motion cases where the uh, median achieved bit rate scales down nicely to 333 BPS, which means that our system can cope with the channel changes imposed by mobility and minimize the packet error rate. There are other evaluations that we had in our paper, including different environments, the effect of different depths, different smartphone models and orientations, and even a network evaluation with multiple users. And you can look at our paper for further details. In conclusion, we present the first acoustic system that can bring underwater messaging to mobile devices. By taking a step back, you know, we can see that the underwater communication market, it's tens of billions of dollars, and it uses, but unfortunately, it focuses primarily on expensive equipment. At the same time, there are tens of millions of people that engage in scuba diving and snorkeling every year, from professional divers to amateur ones, and there are even ocean scientists, even computer scientists, that are interested in exploring the ocean further and performing scientific exploration, but they're really unable to do so with the state of the market as it is now. But by using mobile devices to democratize this kind of capability, we are allowing a much larger portion of the population to explore the oceans beneath us and engage in climate monitoring, environmental sensing, coral monitoring, and so on and so forth. Our work is the first step towards this broader vision of being able to democratize ocean sensing. All the software and data in our system has been open sourced, and you can find more details at the link below. Thank you.
questions? So fun talk. Thank you. Back here. Um, having experience in another hostile environment, namely uh, war zones, uh, and frequency, choosing appropriate frequencies and such, the wisdom there is that you're better off advertising the frequency you'd like to receive in, which is what you're doing with the preamble, by beaconing. That is to say, you are just periodically at certain time frames saying, here's the chunk of the spectrum that I'm in, which means the sender doesn't have to initiate a, a pairwise conversation. You just know at any given time who within your hearing range is available and in what frequency spaces they'd like to work in. Did you look at that alternative or did you just focus on trying to do the preamble negotiation rather than the sort of beaconing done in the other yes, comments? So, yes, so the reason that we selected a uh, split preamble design is that you cannot just use a fixed set of frequencies and blindly transmit on the set of frequencies because the channel changes quite a lot. So well, that's what I'm saying. This is for ch changing channels. I'm not saying that they don't change channels. They do it all the time. I see. So the question is, in a highly variable channel environment, in the military space, they've concluded instead that by beaconing out and saying, here's the current channel for the next n seconds that looks best, that that was actually more efficient use of bandwidth than the preamble model. I see. I think it's a similar idea where we're setting, we're sort of negotiating the same set of frequencies for a given period yes. of time, um, except for the underwater case, we have to do it on this per packet basis due to the channel changing so quickly. So that's why every time we need right. to actually estimate the channel. Yeah, I, I think you're wrong on that, but that's okay. We can talk offline. But it, I just encourage you to go look at what the military guys have done in a similarly dynamic environment. So. Okay, thank you. Hi, so I'm Shuman Banerjee from University of Wisconsin. Great talk. Uh, I am curious as to the use of, uh, are you using this um, one to six kilohertz frequency range, is that what you're using? Yes, we're currently using one to four kilohertz as our transmission okay. band. And is that, uh, that frequency range is um, something, what about, does fish get impacted or is there any impact on? Yeah, so that's actually a really interesting question. So um, as it turns out, um, fish can hear underwater. Some fish, uh, it depends on the fish. So some fish, they can only hear below 10 kilohertz. Some are sensitive to much higher ranges of frequencies. And indeed, the type uh, underwater, you're going to have submarines that are s transmitting very high power sonar, and you're going to have oil rigs that do explosions. And those type of huge power noises will negatively affect the health of fish. But in our case, because we're transmitting at a significantly lower power, it's really just sending buzzes and beeps that don't have much of an effect underwater. In fact, if you want to do it at a slightly higher frequency, potentially, say, in the ultrasonic frequency greater than 20 kilohertz, so that some fish may not even be able to hear it. That's potentially possible because currently, given the state of the industry, 20 kilohertz transmissions are possible on, say, the Amazon Alexa and the Nest, and it's likely to be adopted by smartphones. So if you do that, you can do it in a way that the fish will not even be able to hear it at all. But underwater, humans will still be able to hear at those high frequencies uh, due to bone conduction, and that's just sort of uh, part of the territory of being uh, underwater. Other questions? Yes. Here. So yeah, uh, thanks for the talk as well. Um, I'm Peter from Hamburg University of Technology. Um, so I'm was wondering, you're using the the normal microphone and um, um, and speaker of the phone, and it's in this case where probably there's air in the case, right? So have you tested like, how much? signal you actually lose by this transition between air and water? Yeah, so that's a good question. So if you look at the case that we have here, this is a pretty thin plastic case. And the main effect here is that it acts as a frequency filter. But there are much harder plastic cases that you would have to use at low, much lower depth. So if you want to go to 40 meters, you use the much thicker plastic cases, which would, in fact, introduce acoustic attenuation. But the advantage of our approach is that because we're doing per packet adaptation, for every single packet, we're taking into account the filter effect and the attenuation effect. So let's say you're underwater and you're kind of squeezing the phone around with your fingers and it changes the filter response. We're able to adapt even to that because we're doing adaptation on a per packet basis. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. So